Hello, everyone. Welcome to another thrilling installment of Club Moffat Talks. I've already uh, tripped over my own tongue, tongue by saying every bun, so we're going to be in for a good one today. My name is Chris. I'm Joseph, and I'm an instruction librarian here at Moffat. I'm Ryan. I am the uh, uh, associate librarian for public services. Oh, I guess I'm also an instruction librarian, huh? Yes, you are. Uh, and today we're actually joined by uh, a random salesperson who just decided to call <laughs> us from a, a telemarketing line. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Stacy Johnson. I'm an assistant professor, research and instruction librarian down here at Sam Houston State in Huntsville, Texas. And I was once a library assistant at Moffitt Library in Special Collections and uh, I guess reference too. So I'm happy to be back and talking a little bit with you guys about library land, about kind of the uh, cultural landscape. So yeah, glad to be here. Glad to have you. Absolutely. All right, this is going to be fun. <laughs> uh, so what have we been all getting up to lately? What's um, just to go over it really quickly, because it's been a, about a month since we've last spoken. In fact, it's been about a month since I've spoken to anyone. I just, uh, I come to work, I close my door. None of you see me. We do see you. You walk past the window every day. That was an exaggeration. <laughs> what are we all doing? What are we up to? Stacy, what are what are you watching, reading, doing? Ooh, well, I'm in the midst of finishing up. I think I told you guys, um, judging a category of autobiographies and biographies for an independent book publishing association. So I got about 30 books. Mm -hmm. Can't say much about the titles other than uh, basically a lot of uh, stuff released since COVID. I assumed when I grabbed the category, there would be a lot of folks writing down their personal stories during that downtime in the pandemic. And it's been really interesting. Uh, I'm also really into Splatoon, guys. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with this. It's a Nintendo game. It's a first person shooter, but it is probably the most family friendly, uh, least violent shooters since you're actually shooting ink at your opponents and you're all squid so i've been playing that a lot and that's much to the chagrin of my husband and my daughter who <laughs> dragged me into the owl house we actually watched the entire first and second season last week and started the first two episodes of this i think the final season and i'm excited to kind of talk with you guys if any of you are familiar with it uh, a lot of issues with uh you know it's horror uh cartoons so as we know, that's that's two things that generally you know, we go together there, um, but it deals a lot uh, with, you know, issues of belonging, of being the outsider in a group, uh, even being the outsider among outsiders. And it features a lot of talented cast members. I'm a huge fan of Gravity Falls, which was a, another show. Uh, the showrunner there was Alex Hirsch. He's actually a voice actor on uh, Owl House. And I believe at one point, I'm not sure how he and the creator, Dana Terrence, they were uh, involved, maybe romantically, not sure if they still are. This is all coming from my 10 year old. So <laughs> gotta verify. <laughs> so yeah, I've been watching that and enjoying something that is, you know, a little bit different for a kid's show because you're an adult and you're watching it and you're thinking oh man <laughs> another kids show but it'll surprise you with really funny jokes and just strange kind of um setups because it's all about witches and demons mm -hmm. you know and there's a lot of witch battles a lot of magic battles so i've really been enjoying that and then also of course spending my time here teaching information literacy to students uh both in the library instruction classroom and then also in a, a four credit uh, course online so yeah, I can talk in a few minutes about some of the things going on with that, but I'll pass it off to one of you guys to talk about what you've been up to. Okay. I have been watching a new anime by the same guy who did Blam and Knights of um, Sidora? Is it Sidora? Sidonia. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Kenya and the Snow Sea, and I really love it so far. I think it's Kaina and the Great Snow Sea. Well, just I watched, the, I watched like a half an episode of it. It's really good. <laughs> cool. And that's Anybody actually else? something, sorry to interrupt, but that's something oh, no. that's about Owl House, super big anime draw, like lots of mm -hmm. anime influence. I mean, <clears throat> everything from the music to the styling of the characters. So yeah, really I saw Gravity that. Falls had like a, a pretty big Evangelion uh, mm -hmm influence. Oh, yeah. Like not, not so much the giant robots, but like the, the kind of like, the 
set pieces and, mm-hmm. and like the the way like um like the apocalyptic stuff at some point near the end like yep. I, I saw some clips for that and i was like wow that is like that's eye-opening that's crazy that they they went so heavy in on that and for it to like to be western animation for kids like it's it's i'm really happy to see that that's catching on too yeah joe anything going on with you i'm trying to read more um what well (laughs) as a librarian get out of here the times have been rough a, a, a weird thing happened like let's say 2020 let's say that uh where i just lost my ability to focus to read uh so for the last couple of years i've been watching a lot of mindless programming uh not not necessarily the program was mindless but that's the way that i absorbed it you know sort of like that you know like eating a whole bowl of popcorn and you don't even realize that you're eating it but then suddenly it's gone like that with you know video intake but um and i used to read uh not as much as like because uh my wife and daughter read a lot more than i do they were reading two to three hundred books a year and i would read like 50 books a year and feel like I was reading a lot but I got where I was reading like a book a year Mm -hmm. uh and so far this year I've read like three or four books Mm -hmm. uh and Caitlin had that same kind of thing happen to her so like her her goal for this year for 2023 is to read 23 books and she feels like that that's a reasonable amount you know and that's sort of what I'm going for. Uh, and I'm counting anything that can be remotely called a book. So I've read a couple of graphic novels, and I've uh, read the second book in the Magicians trilogy by uh, Lev Grossman. And I'm getting the third one through interlibrary loan, so it'll be coming in soon. Uh, but I've been doing that. And uh, yeah, watching a lot of stuff. Uh, and I, I, we've been having this weird tendency where we start watching things that are already over or are about to be over. Because like we just watched the two seasons that are out of uh, Only Murders in the Building. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we find ourselves re-watching things and you know, stuff like that. I'm trying to catch up with Critical Role, which I've actually been enjoying. Um, and I've actually... I had watched all of campaign two and then went back and watched campaign one and I'm almost caught up with campaign three, which is the one they're doing now. They're on like episode 48 and I'm on like episode 33. So I'm going to, I'm going to get there. That's it. Cool. <clears throat> I've got a lot actually. Uh, and I'm going to try to get through it really, really quickly. Um, uh, watching my wife and I just finished Mad Men uh that's like a top three show for me i love that show now it's exactly yeah uh there was like a slump in like season two or three where i was like eh, i don't know it's it's kind of losing its luster and then like some stuff happens around that point uh later season three season four and stuff where i would just something something hit for me and i was like okay i'm i've got to i've got to pay attention because this is this is just fantastic um we're starting the x-files now never watched the x-files um oh i don't know gosh. why i love twin what's that i love twin peaks yeah huge I love fan Pe- yeah gravity... oh um, gravity falls borrows from twin peaks i so heard about that too that's kind of that's interesting yeah. to me too because i'm yeah. um my daughter is only one she's she's 13 months old so it's basically like anything with lights and noise to it she she'll she'll kind of watch um we're on our second rewatch of Bluey, and the only time she pays attention is the opening, and she'll like, she'll be fiddling around with whatever, and it's it's kind of amazing because even when she was little, and now especially that she's like noticing like audio cues and stuff more, the moment that music starts, she's like, and then she'll watch, she'll just. <laughs> Is it the X Files music you're talking about, or the Bluey music? Bluey, the Bluey okay, theme okay. song. I found a. a from like the official YouTube channel, it was like a ten minute loop of the opening just going. She watched the whole thing. I have a picture of her 
uh, like from a side angle so that you could see her like her mouth open. So she's watching it like <laughs> whole time, just uninter uninterrupted the whole time. Yeah, uh, my kid at that age was really into X Files, the music, and would actually oh, like yeah. dance to it, you know. <laughs> and nowadays we tell her, "Do you remember?" And she's like, "Yeah, yeah, but that show's weird." You know, she likes oh. that stuff. But we were watching like Game of Thrones when she was in the crib. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not adv oh, yeah. advocating for that, but I am saying my child is very tough and <laughs> resilient. <laughs> no, I was playing. Um... I would play Elden Ring while she was in like the um like the baby rocker yeah. thing like the suspended thing and um my father-in-law was like you you think you might want to put something with less carrying on and stuff in it and I was and I like <laughs> looked over at him and then I went back to it I was like no she's not she sees a big haze of red right now I'm not really I'm not concerned about what she's the messages she's picking up on right now so no, but nowadays, like eh, maybe I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, she she can identify like the Twin Peaks theme because that's the one that's like uh, put that on and calm down. Now let's uh, talk about this for a minute. Angelo Badalamenti, got uh, rest in peace. We talked well, about that in the last uh, podcast. Oh, did you? Actually. All yeah. right. Well, uh, I got I, I, I gotta jump you. on that and say, yeah. man, that makes me sick. There Talented. are a lot of a lot of people from. Twin Peaks, especially, but a lot of David Lynch associates who yeah. have passed away recently, and that's yes. just heartbreaking. Some really, really talented actors and performers, musicians. It just it just breaks my heart. But Elementi, though, like I, I remember the first thing I thought of when I saw that he had passed away, I thought of that uh, video where he's talking about how he composed Laura Palmer's theme song, mm -hmm. and Lynch is saying, "Oh, you're tearing my heart in half, Angelo." And reading that, that was the first thing I thought was, well, now my heart's torn in half. This is unbelievable. <sighs> Sad. He did other music, too, though. He did other stuff aside oh, from yeah. David Lynch. But it, he's just, he's such a fantastic composer and just such a, such a loss. Um, well, let's see. Just to run through things. Uh, I don't want to talk about J.K. Rowling because I'm sick of reading about her. But I did, um, I did just finish, uh, I did just finish reading uh, the second Harry Potter book to my daughter because they're I they're the copies I've had since I was a kid and I read them when I was a kid and it's it's one of those things where I'm like I'm not giving J.K. Rowling money right now but I'm not I'm also not going to pretend like I don't love Harry Potter or have since I was a child so you know yeah. it's this brings That's... up something maybe to talk about these these people that we enjoy their creations right we're talking about yeah. uh let's let's go back in time like roman polanski for example right we know oh, he did some yeah. shady things people still accept him as an artist uh jk rowling too i can kind of separate her art and her work from her personal statements to a point her but older then... stuff like harry potter especially where it was like yeah yeah there are some kind of ignorant things like the way that she names characters or whatever but it's kind of yeah. like harmless like kid stuff like it's gross out whatever like from that it's kind of easy to just say like ah she was just writing from a perspective of like a mom talking to their kids or whatever but nowadays if you read some of her like the plot lines to the books that she writes now it's like mm -mm, no that's yeah, yeah. but you just um, kind of I wonder about you guys if you're when this type of consumer who literally will look at a person and say, well, they believe X, Y, Z, so I'm done. I don't want anything to do with them. Or are you more the types that are like, oh, I don't, you know, I can separate the art from the artist. Is that, you know, I've, I'm just thinking about this in my own kind of mind. Well, I don't know. It's hard for me to separate well, the art from the artist. Let me, let me talk about that for a second, because um, not only have I done a class on H.P. Lovecraft, it's mm -hmm. the books are behind me right there. Mm -hmm. I am planning on doing one in the future. And this was a concern for me and the professor who's doing this because H.P. Lovecraft was incredibly racist. Racist, yes. Um, but that being said, it's interesting because the number, there's something out there called the new mythos, um, which is a new genre. And it seems to really attract women and minorities to it. And it's interesting that um, this type of this type of literature is really appealing to people that H.P. Lovecraft absolutely hated to some extent. And um, it ultimately comes down to the what's the, what's the greatest evil of existential horror? It's the fact that in the face of existential horror, racism doesn't matter, basically. 
and that he viewed as, as a horrible, awful thing that that was true, where most uh, writers out there embrace it. You have people like Lovecraft Country, and a lot of the women writers are involved with new the, involved with new weird. They've embraced uh, the Lovecraftian model as a good thing, as everything that that basically that H.P. Lovecraft was saying. Oh, this is evil. This is wrong. This is terrible. They've reversed it. They've they managed to embrace it. And I don't think that would have happened had these people stayed away from his writings to some extent. So right. I guess my point is that good things can come out of terrible, horrible authors to some extent. And the, the interesting thing about Love, Lovecraft Country, I haven't read the book, but for the television show at least, the for a lot of stuff, I, I really kind of roll my eyes at the we're the monsters all along kind of thing. But for Lovecraft Country, it being humans and human suffering in the face of grand cosmic uh plots and machinations and horrors is um it's a really interesting use of lovecraft to uh to kind of take that angle for it uh but yeah um one of my favorite manga series is veroni kenshin um it's older it's about a uh uh wandering swordsman who won't kill um came out in the early to mid 90s or something um and way after that the author was arrested for um for illicit materials um and pornography and stuff and uh at this point i'm like well they're still making products based on his stuff but and i've already bought the entire run of the manga but now people are like they're making a new anime adaptation of it knowing what that guy has done and what he's responsible for so on one hand i'm like yeah i i would love to support like the studio doing that it's a franchise that i like but it's a new take on on this stuff knowing what the author is responsible for mm -hmm. so then it's it it comes to a matter of is is it really that you can say that the other people who are doing these new takes on it like studios or whatever can you say that they're blameless even if there are people who are just doing their job like like coding a video game or doing animation or whatever like the people at the top of the studio are obviously not ignorant mm -hmm. that's that's where it gets really muddy for me yeah again my example had the benefit of 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 Lovecraft being dead for 90 years. So, yeah. yeah. And, and you mentioned to me before, actually, uh, a really interesting take with Lovecraft in his later life is that a lot of his work started to kind of reflect that that racist aspect of, like, or his early stuff is very clearly, like, he doesn't make his, he like, he doesn't uh, make it to where you can mistake his thoughts. He He's very, he wears his, his, um, his bigotry on his shoulders but by the end like um there there's that scene in, at the end of the shadow over Innsmouth where the main character kind of starts to realize that like he's as he's looking at himself he sees the the fish people like aspects of his like his look and like mm -hmm. he kind of embraces that he's not the person he thought he was um so it's it, almost like it's kind of like Lovecraft started to consider that all of this stuff is a, a I think he less. did that honestly. I think he did that subconsciously, and I think that was the aspect of the horror: mm -hmm. the fact that oh my god, maybe black people are just like us. Oh, you know. Well, there's that. There's <laughs> also really what's, what's the what's going on with him to some extent, and yeah. I, I think that's the part that people have embraced. Because again, one of his last you mentioned Shadow of Innsmouth. That's one of his middle period uh, works. One of his oh, last yeah. works was it was a was a period was something called the Shadow of Time. And um, in that one, it ends with the huge, horrible monsters with the main character saying they were just like us. Coming to the realization, these horrible, terrible monsters were just like, were just people. Hmm. And that's the horror of the representation of it. So it's hard to say, was he was he lightening up or was he going with the idea, oh my God, black people are just like us, can you imagine, type of horror. Which I mean, makes it worse, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, since I'm 
So I, I really don't want to derail it into a into a oh, really yeah. controversial topic because we're... we can talk about this for two. I can talk about this for two or yeah. three days. So yeah. Oh yeah. Um, to cover the last of what I'm doing. Um, well, ironically, uh, I'm watching the Last of Us show. It's better than the game. Um, I'm playing a video game series. I don't know if I've mentioned it before. Called Trails. It's been running since 2004, and it's nine games deep. Uh, with the 10th nice. one coming out in July. They're all 80-hour RPGs, and I'm so ready to be able to put them down for a few months. <laughs> because I started them last June with the Steam Summer Sale, and I'm just about done with them. And it's like a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm just, I'm so glad to be done. <laughs> um, even, I, I've enjoyed it, but I'm I'm glad to be done with it. Or you can just stop. Just No. Just <laughs> I like it. I told you I, I enjoy it, but I but i would like i like i'm anticipating not enjoying it for a little while um and also on the edge of my seat for the next uh xenoblade uh dlc story thing i'm so excited for that i um i watched the trailer for from the last nintendo direct and i think my mind stopped working for like a half hour i think i watched it and then like i blinked and i had sent like 50 text messages to people and then the direct was over so so I'm so excited. Um, that's it. That's all I've got. I'm finally done. I can I can stop talking now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so space silence. Talk 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 to us about stuff. What? Well, let's, <laughs> okay. So we can kind of take this in in this in this direction. You know, I am uh, told you guys about Chat GPT. And this is a monster or a, a, a horror, if you will, for our uh, academic friends in many places uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, and it's funny because, you know, you guys were talking about how, oh, gosh, the monsters, you know, like us or like me, you know, and that's the thing, you know, things that really scare us are, are that which are just slightly off. Right. And, and I don't know if you yeah. guys have looked at any of this AI generated art. And oh, I should have like uh, pulled some up. There was one that was like people shaking hands and it was like, you know, they're, six they're, different hands. The it's finger so, is wrapped around the, yes, the whole yes. hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's so frightening. It's off putting. It's unnerving because it's just slightly wrong, you know, and that triggers something in our innate fear response because it should be right. And everything's almost telling us it is, but it's not. And with ChatGPT, if you guys are aware, this is this new program that's a uh, high powered ability to basically spit out conversational English, right? You, you know, and it's based on uh, input of just millions of different uh, text input into this neural network, right? And it makes decisions based on probability, like that words are going to be close to each other. And so for us as faculty, we look at this and say, oh my gosh, the sky's falling. Students are now going to just use this. We're done. Well, I'm going to say there's evil to it, right? And I'm going to start with evil because we <laughs> like evil. Um, and then maybe say some things about the good, because in the evil side, we have this whole fear that it's going to be a, 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 you know, a plagiarism tool. And, and in fact, as an instructor who has writing assignments uh, that my students complete, uh, December came along and I may have, I think I probably did have one or two who submitted chat GPT generated text. And the reason I said this, and it goes back to that art thing, it's just slightly wrong. Um, I don't know, you guys, my background, I was there in Wichita Falls as a reporter and editor at the Times Record News for about a decade before entering li the library game. And so I did a lot of the tasks that chat GPT programs can do, like Friday night football scores, those yeah, things, yeah. they're like automated. Yeah. Obituaries, actually free obituaries had already become um, automated yeah. by the time I left the newspaper because you literally fill out a form, survivors, the day of the service, this thing. Uh, not to be, you know, insensitive, but that's, you know, something that I think the, could be a, a promising thing. So I come into it with a little different point of view as being somebody who could be replaced by a computer at one point in time <laughs> and thinking, well, you know, there's actually some nice things about it because 
you know, certain aspects can be automated and probably should be. And we already have. And like we all know we have. I don't have one with me because I'm my phone, but calculators. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit young for this, but I know there was probably this same sense of they're not going to do math anymore. And they go. And I mean, yeah, in some ways that probably has occurred a little bit. Maybe people aren't quite as facile with like, you know, figuring out figures without their little calculator. But I mean, we are not at the point where the calculator is doing, you know, mathematical theory. Right. It just can't do it. And the chat GPT is the same thing. I mean, sure, it could probably write an undergraduate level paper about information literacy and what that means. You are going to get a thing that basically is a bunch of words strung together in phrases and whether or not it actually makes sense is a whole other thing. But the ultimate point about it is I think there can be good coming out of this. I think it can be a tool for automating, like I said, some things where we could maybe free up brain space for more complicated issues and study. I think it could also be a great tool in the instruction classroom where you would have students tell them, here's what I want you to put into chat GPT and let's examine what we get out from it. And that is a hugely powerful tool for students who are learning writing because oh, yeah, they yeah. get to become the editor, right? They get to become the fact checker and actually look at it and say, oh, um, and then, you know, I feel like for me personally, another big push for it is the ability to teach people English. You know, this can be a powerful tool for teaching folks English and for having researchers have access to English language items that we know is, you know, the lingua franca of the world for, for you know, science for sure, which is my area. So I think there's some really promising things about it. It's just a matter of telling people this is like close, but no cigar, right, guys? You could explain to your students and say, yeah, you can input this prompt in here, but what you're going to get out, you know, and I've read through, oh, there's so many funny things they've had it do. But the worst, scariest thing, let's be honest, is its ability to spit out, uh, you know, hate speech, to spit out uh, possible propaganda on a level of which we have never seen, uh, you know, and so that's a whole other issue that has to be faced because, you know, we could put in, okay, don't, you know, say these X, Y, Z, but there's, you guys know, there's always evolving hate, if you will. There's always, there's always more, you know, hate groups out there. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I wondered about you guys there on campus at MSU, if your faculty had talked about it, if you'd heard much about it up there. Um, at the last TRC meeting, which I did not attend because I was out sick, apparently it was one of the topics that they talked about doing and possibly putting a panel together to talk about. It. So yes, it is well known on this campus um, among the faculty, apparently. And they are talking about, and again, we might do something this year on it um, yeah. for the uh, for the TRLC committee. And we knew it was coming. I mean, every, I mean, and let's be clear, there's been other systems. This one just is very quick, you know, and is able to really do things. And I mean, Bing, you know, Microsoft has Bing that's coming out with it. It's got not only the technology behind that chat GPT, but also their Prometheus, which is creepy and awesome. <laughs> Well, I'll, throw a few, I'll throw a few things at you because when this sort of stuff came up about pictures and basically we're talking yeah. about art to some extent we're talking right. about um, computers writing things and producing works of art whether mm -hmm. it be music whether it be visual arts whether it be literature and that's what we're really talking about there's a couple things that that had me swing toward this is a good thing away from the the unpositive things the first is I saw a lot of people online saying I've never been good at art, but I have all these pictures, all these ideas in my head that I want to put out there. This is a great tool for me. This is a great, fantastic tool for me to do this because I don't have the talent or the or the money or the, the long or the experience to go through art school to get to that point where I can do these sort of things. This gives me a tool I can work with. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm I'm good at like coming up with subject terms. I'm good at like aligning different types of things that when put together, that can create something that's really at least close to an approximation of what they're thinking of. Another thing that, that gives me hope as well is the fact that in this country, anything produced by a computer cannot be copyrighted. I don't know if you guys knew that, but um, yes. you cannot copyright a piece of art produced by by, a, by an AI or produced by a machine in any, in any format. And until that changes, I think this will be something beneficial yeah, because it's, as you said, it's just another tool to some extent. Yeah. I know there there are there are artists who are freaking out about this. Um, I know that there are people who are pushing back on this because it's going to affect them uh, financially to some extent, and it will. I'm sorry, it just will. That's that's the the fact of automation. We all we're all librarians here. We all know how automation has really cut down the number of jobs in the last yep. 20 years that libraries used to do. Um, it's just a fact of automation that jobs will go away, unfortunately. 
And but there's been talk about this in the library sphere, right? About somehow harnessing this possibly. And we do have a chat bot, right? We already have that oh, yeah, yeah. to answer chat questions. I know many people use it. So yeah, there's been talk about it. Could it be used as a cataloging tool? Could it be used as, you know, uh, a way to do name, name authority, these kind of things. So could it program, could it, could it write us an instruction session? I mean, maybe. You know, that was something it. that I was thinking about as well when you were talking about using it for like information literacy, using it for like um, like library science, like courses or something, being able to automatically come up with different um, different exercises or different works, say that that would utilize like just pull subject headings out of the air or, or name authorities or whatever, and just use that to just create what would otherwise be extremely time consuming, uh, like thought exercises or whatever. That seems like a good idea. I have, I have like a million thoughts on this, by the way, I don't know what, what all I, we want to get into, but um, you mentioned using it for like, like racist or, or bigoted right. uh, type of language. Are you, are you familiar with the, um, the Google, I think AI yes. called Tay? Was this the one? Well, I know about the one where it started like pushing out like extremist. Is that the oh, one you're yeah. talking about? Yeah, yeah. they they um yeah. they, they people on Twitter turned it into a Nazi. Yes, like yeah. um like a literal like talked about Hitler Nazi. Yes, um and that stuff is so crazy that you can rattle radicalize a computer because when I'm thinking about writing like using Chat GPT or something to write an essay, I think about when I'm looking up references or citations or whatever for an essay that I'm doing, I look those up to support an opinion that I have. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, you're writing an essay to talk about uh, a fact of of your subject or you're talking about, um, like, whatever it is that you've been assigned in your class. And you want to you want to find citations that support your your opinion. They they um, they either support your, your research or you're using them for a counterpoint. So then you can say, well, this is what opposition believes. And this is why I don't agree with that. And this is why people who are opposed to that opposition, this is what they say. And chat AI stuff cannot have opinions or theoretically they can't have opinions, but then they can be trained to be um, racist and like have ideologies. Like, that's where stuff gets really frightening to me. Um, are you familiar with the uh, Uncanny Valley? No. So there's a there's a belief that um, the the cl the closer things get to looking human, the more oh. you're willing to like yeah. believe that you're looking at like a picture of a person, you're looking at a picture of a dog, right? Landscape, whatever. But then there's a point, and it's called the uncanny valley uncanny because valley. it's like that familiarity and your like, I guess the the amount that you're willing to suspend your disbelief. It's for a it. graph. You can yeah. have a graph basically. Yeah. It graph plummets things. as mm -hmm. soon as you get to a certain point where things are just they're just there's something not right. Your familiarity with it just stops recognizing it as what you're looking at. Um, uh, did did any of us watch the that new Chippendales movie? I swear this all this is all coming back together. Ryan's seen it. There's a bit where they go into it's it's kind of like a like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit thing where like cartoons exist in the real world. They go to the Uncanny Valley, <laughs> like, a, like a a street that's based on that, and it's like playstation 2 graphics were yeah, like, it's basically yeah, it's basically computer graphics like, from like 15 20 years ago yeah, type of like thing. they they go to um like a i think it's like a model of um beowulf from that cg cartoon and he's just <laughs> looking straight ahead like he can't move his face or his <laughs> eyes or anything and his expressions are neutral and that's like a perfect example of what i'm thinking of here where it's like there's there's just a, a level where like you said, like you could be reading an essay and you just know that a human didn't write this. And you can't, you can't tell what it is. You can look at a picture that an AI is drawn. You can look at an essay that AI has written. And there's just a point where, where you just know in your heart, like this is a human being did not think of these words in this order. And they, they might have been able to, 
but there's just something wrong with it. So I'm so happy you brought up Beowulf because actually in my notes, Grendel, and going oh. way back in time to my uh, British lit classes and talking about, you know, the outsider. Uh, oh, because yeah. Grendel, the monster, you know, he was lurking on the edge and he was, you know, outside of their standards and norms and coming in and attacking him. Um, but let's talk very briefly because ChatGPT, as you guys maybe know, has like an antidote. There's like a student at, I think, Princeton. Did y'all hear about this? Yes, no, I heard anyway. about this who brought out what he calls, what is it, chat zero or GPT zero, where what he's done is created a program to test and see if these things are created by AI. And I think you're bringing this up. Basically, we know in human natural, when we're writing or when we're speaking, there's what we call burstiness. There's like differences, like we'll have some short sentences followed by some long sentences, right? And then you'll also see complexity in, in what's being stated. There's going to be, you know, differences because it's unique. Hopefully the writing that you're doing is, is something that has not been fed into uh, the algorithm for ChatGPT yet. And so those two actual parameters can be used to look and say, okay, this is, this is maybe AI produced. And so that's the thing that you can say is it's so close to human, but you can really still see these two or three, you know, kind of things that make you realize, okay, no, we're not dealing with an intelligent thing. We're dealing with something that's just been fed in input and is, you know, has a, an algorithm, has a, a linear regression that's basically telling it, okay, well, if this, this, and this, then weight these things and spit out the, you know, your output. So yeah, like these things, training them to, to uh, there's another thing. It's like when they, not when they're hate speech, but when they're um, giving you things that are wrong, and like making things up, they call that hallucinations that these things are having, really? which I thought was awesome. I was like, wavy gravy on the chat GPT, you know? <laughs> that, is, that is so cool. <laughs> so that's something else. Cause I think a guy, a writer I was saying was like a fan of a golf star who had the similar name as him. And so this reporter or writer writes it and talks about it in chat GPT at first knows, okay, you are not the famous golfer. But then the next thing it asks it, the chat GPT is like, you love the game of golf, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's like these things that are just super whack. And I mean, as, as, as advanced, you know, as we're in the library sphere and all of us are pretty familiar with it, information, how to access, re, you know, use it and evaluate. I just fear for a lot of my undergraduate students who really just don't think to stop and question what it is they're reading, you know, being susceptible to some of that chat GPT possible, you know, hate speech or just hallucinations that they have, which is, like I said, it's awesome. Um, I don't know, like the chat GPTs, like out in the desert with Beavis and Butthead, you know, if y'all remember the movie. <laughs> I just rewatched it like last month. <laughs> oh, sucks. man. So, yeah, it's a, a matter of, like Ryan says, it's a, it's a tool yeah. and we can't really go, oh, forget about it, don't use it. And I brought it up in my discussion with my students last week because they had a writing assignment due and I literally told them, and this is another thing to think about as a faculty and as a librarian, you have to consider what you're asking them to do with writing. And what I told them all was, look, I'm looking for your individual thoughts. I'm not looking for a research. I just want to know your thoughts about what quality information is. You know, it made it very clear to them. And I told them, look, this is not an assignment where you need chat GPT. You know, I'm asking for you to tell me what you think. And so if you can couch it in those terms or maybe frame it for your students so they know the value of why they're writing that way maybe avoid some of the whole issue with you know them cheating with it well this this reminds me that really chat gt is not doing anything different that wasn't done years ago with the secretary pool or the clerks where they're taking the broad ideas and they're putting it in a format that can be easily yep. read yep and exactly. even that that detector for it, that doesn't sound too different from what uh, professors already use to detect. Uh, exactly. Uh, Plagiarism. Safe me. assign or what is it? Turn it in. and Yeah, turn it in. Stuff like that. Um, forgeries. Some, something like that. Yeah, like that's that's already using a form of AI. It's not as sophisticated, but it's it is the same kind of concept. And yeah, that could be used for a world of good. Uh, and yeah, it is just a matter of like who's using that tool. And I, I can totally see where like a fake news or, or a sensationalist website could use it to just generate harmful articles and just mm -hmm. turn it into like a content mill for them. But at the same time, like it, it we just use it for academic purposes. We can just use it to, to check on you know, are they, are the students using their citations correctly? Mm -hmm. Just something, something as simple as that. 
So that's where it becomes like, it's always interesting to me to see these kind of concepts where you can't just automatically throw them out, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, that's the mm -hmm. phrase, because there's too much good in them to just totally ignore on its mm -hmm. face. On the other hand, I am reminded a little bit of Ian Banks' series, the Culture series. You guys ever read that that science fiction series before? It postulates a far, far future where basically AI is running everything. It is well, a utopia. Matrix. It's probably the best utopia you'll find in science fiction. Humanity can do whatever you want. If you live, if you're human, you live in the society, you can you can do you you live a life of leisure and do whatever you want, basically. And then you read it and you go, oh my God, we're pets. We are literally these AI's pets that they are yep. that, that they are taken care of because sometimes we're useful and they take comfort in us because we created <laughs> them. But we have no power and no agency whatsoever. We are just little little fluffy lap dogs to these AI overlords. I know this. On the other hand, real. I would love to love it live in that in that in that <laughs> universe because whatever you want. I mean, it's just a life of Where's the problem? whatever you want, basically. So you're telling me we turn into furry Persians like my little angry pretty much yeah Coco, yeah. yeah cats they're that's pretty much it i just rewatched the matrix for for the first time in a long time too so that's when i think of that that's the first thing that comes to mind so we're, we're all we're all living in little bubbles where the the robots can take our uh body heat but they're Batters. doing it in a way that we actually don't mind I will point out that according to the law of thermodynamics, you cannot put more heat into a thing than you get out of it. Don't worry about it. It's a Gnostic <laughs> par uh, parable. Don't worry about it. Don't. It doesn't matter. It's an allegory. So, uh, <laughs> we could continue talking about this forever. I think that's how I, I usually um, begin all of our... Uh, transition into the next part of the podcast because it literally every time we we bring someone on we get so heated and talking about all these fantastic things but uh we don't want you to have to waste your time all day with us uh, or nah. almost putting up on an hour and you know there's uh a million things we could talk about with chat gpt because like literally it's it's going to become a major thing like Right now, even when it's still in its infancy, we still have so much to talk about. Just imagine what it's going to look like when it evolves. Yeah, like I would say, it's going to improve. Yeah, it's already, there's an article I read, oh, I'll have to go find it, but Guy was kind of taking the new Bing through its paces, and he's claiming it's a little better than Chat GPT for many things, but mm. still will push out hallucinatory content. But there are several things that it has actually improved uh, from ChatGPT, like which you know, like we said, just came out what November, I think, December. This so. yeah, three months worth of it being alive, and this is what we're already talking about with it. It's it's so fascinating. And it's tough too, guys. When you're an instructor and you look at this paper that someone's turned in, and you think it's ChatGPT, here's the problem: How do you go about accusing someone of this or proving yeah. it? I'm sitting there reading it and I'm like, you know, I could put a note on this that says, I think you use chat GPT. But I guess you could just use like, there's a quality level here that we have to, yes. like, we have to kind of talk about where it's like, well, this is a decent paper, but there's something about the overall quality of it that yes. I, I'm not really buying. Like, I, I we need to talk about it because I don't want to give you poor grades i don't want to give you bad feedback on this if this is your thoughts and it's meeting the requirements but at the same time there are some things that i'm not comfortable with that that you used as a technique here and it could be as simple as that like your yeah technique doesn't match the style guides that we're using yeah so. yeah that's that's another thing too is i think yeah style templates is also another way to deal with that if you have a specific way you want the paragraph written APA like you want them to discuss basically start off with description and move to analysis or something like that. But there's yeah. also a way you could probably um, overcome that. Yeah. You know. I think it just reminds me, I know you guys, I've told you I'm in the, I'm in the old TV. I watch a lot of Columbo. It's kind of like when the kill, you know, when the killer is like sitting there taunting Columbo and he doesn't have any like evidence, but he knows, <laughs> he knows they did it. It's like that. I mean, you know, you just kind of sit there and, and I mean, like you're saying, yeah, the, the comment they've gotten from me is, you have a lot of words here, but you're not saying anything. 
Exactly. Yeah. Because that's literally kind of, what it is. It's like the you know information literacy value that you can bring from the value. You know, and you'll see these phrases. And so, yeah, a lot of it. You know, you can look. And I will say things like, "This looks like it could have been written by a computer." You know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm you get your Columbo the, one more yeah, thing. Yeah. Moment just one more thing. Just, just one, one more thing. thing. No, I am totally the disheveled librarian up here. Like I come up here and I'm like, <laughs> I got like a crumply shirt and I'm like so. Good. <laughs> when i don't have coffee oh. Oh, okay so i'm i'm the you of this library then yes okay wonderful you took the mantle <laughs> i, I came I in left. today and i had like a full like <laughs> apple core antenna thing in my hair <laughs> and i was like i need to really brush my hair before we get into this this podcast but then but then i got to thinking that um uh our our bedtime routine for the baby is uh read whatever book we're reading right now i said it's harry potter then we do like brush her hair brush her teeth read a bedtime story and put her in bed um and the last two or three nights i've been brushing her hair and um usually maybe it takes like 30 seconds or whatever so i'm like yeah brush 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 everything looks good and there was like just a thing just sticking up on her head like this like right like a unicorn horn but yep. obviously her hair is short because she's only a year old but um i'm brushing it and i'm thinking like damn it this isn't good. like what am i doing wrong here um and then i thought oh wait she has my hair and this this oh right the this, ca- yeah uh, apple stem <laughs> antenna thing that i've got going on i'm gonna embrace it just hey, for today i'm gonna embrace it do. and say it's fine um and also since you mentioned uh watching older tv since like i said x-files right um we watched the menu because my mom was in town and we were like, what's the, you know, my mom doesn't have streaming services. She has terrible satellite internet. So let's find something that's, that's relatively new. And I'm just like, I got to watch a new movie recently and I feel so like, just, just so warm inside. And just, I'm so happy that I'm, that I'm not 30 years behind on my entertainment for one night. (laughs) That was us. I saw Puss in Boots. Uh, the last wish oh man guys you know i liked it there was a cut co- there were a couple of things about it that i was like whoa is this too scary because like the villain is death and and olivia's and not to spoil too much but my daughter's yeah. been telling me this is the best villain this is the most powerful villain and i'm like okay <laughs> so we go see this movie and of course i saw the first one years ago i mean it's, you know i don't even barely remember i've seen shrek and all those but anyway oh yeah <laughs> he's actually death and he's super creepy the actor is um i'm gonna butcher his name it's wagner moano i think he's the guy that played pablo escobar in narcos and he's actually mm. brazilian um but he had to teach himself spanish to be in that show and then in this show of course we put some boots so there's like you know that kind of espanol a little bit of a of a tint but when i'm listening to this guy kind of things that aren't right going back to that i'm like man this guy sounds like he has a spanish accent but it's not there's something different and sure enough I always tell the guy up, i'm like okay he's brazilian yeah he's brazilian so it's portuguesa so anyway but his voice oh it's wonderful he's got that very deep kind of you know and he's like puss and you're just scared because you know it's like any of those spaghetti westerns you start hearing the the whistling you know and i can't mm-hmm. i don't i can't do it. my daughter can emulate it and i'm just like creepy i'm creeped out as it is and then this guy shows up and he's got like the double like sword thingy what are those things called where it's like the curved the he's got, yes he's got which, all which, the pussies. yeah that would make sense because yeah. death it's usually death. has the, the big so, the scythe. yeah there's that and then he's also got like all of Puss's several, you know, his eight other lives, you know, listed out and it's great. <laughs> so then of course the, my best and favorite part about this show was they, they kind of said, tell Puss, okay, you're on your last life. You got to go retire, you know, go to a home. Here's miss aunt Lulu's or whatever. And it's like a cat lady who adopts cats. And so he goes, <laughs> <laughs> dude, y'all, it is the best. It's like the cat geriatric home. They start playing the music. This is the end, you know, the doors. <laughs> and I am just like dying laughing in the theater, you know, because they're showing the cats all at the trough, like sadly eating the dried food. And it Come shows on. them lined up to use the litter box. I mean, it is just, it is a riot. I think I was the only one laughing, but man, that killed me. And the movie's pretty good. I mean, the villains are good in it. It was, inter- it was engaging. I used to review films. A lot of them used to bore the crap out of me, but this one was decent it was pretty good but yeah that's the first new movie i've seen since i mean i went to encanto that was the last new movie i saw and that's been oh like yeah a year or two years ago so yeah i don't oh, know I saw, I saw that one actually we watched it on 
Disney Plus, I think, that but still, be. yeah, it's talking yeah. about magical realism. A lot of magic in that show. I think they said. I think they mentioned that um, Gabriel Gabriel uh, Garcia yeah, it's, Marquez it's was like a direct Day, influence yeah. on it, and yeah. it really feels like like it a does. Disney-fied hundred years of solitude. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. Um, I'm. I actually asked my mom. Uh, do you think she'll be like 15, 16 months? Do you think it'll be too distracting if I take my daughter to see the Mario movie? And my mom was like, no. Yeah. We did Sean the Sheep when mine was like three and we put her in light up shoes. And sure enough, she like ran the whole length of the theater, like the whole time. So we could just see her running with her light up shoes. So that's my <laughs> recommendation. If you're going to take her with she's about two and a half, three, and then put the light up shoes so you can just like see her running, you know? But yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'll definitely do that one. That sounds fun. Um, the legend goes that my mom took me to see Jurassic Park at three. Oh, wow. Um, and it was a, a, a miserable experience for everyone involved. Um, man now i feel old so that's what i'm thinking of now is <laughs> will, I, will it be a problem if i ruin the mario movie for people but i don't know there'll probably be a lot of kids it's kind of like i was at Brickfest yeah. last weekend down here in houston at energy center with all the you know lego oh man it was such a kid a lot of kids and so like the kids are all doing crazy stuff but it's just like everybody knows you know uh oh sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're not we're not going here to see like a, a full like a, a critical reception of like some award-winning movie we're here to see a fun cartoon yeah you're not there for a terry malick film we're not there for <laughs> you know we're, we're, <laughs> tree of life or whatever <laughs> whatever that new darren aronofsky thing is we're so yeah. we're all gonna sit here and cry yeah yeah <laughs> well you know, we've i've we, I've had a great time here talking with you, Stacey. Um, anything you've got coming up in the near future? Just trying to publish some some work. One's on a, a, a poet from Galveston, Texas, by the name mm. of John Schullender. He was a Swedish guy who came to Texas in the 1870s and uh, became what they called the, the, the poet of Cedar Bayou down here in Galveston. He actually had O. Henry couch surfing on his couch for a while and influenced huh. a lot of people. Pretty cool poet. And then another one I'm working on is social media and the library guys. Woo. Still going on all these years oh, later, yeah. all this craziness yeah. with Twitter, Elon Musk. We could go into that. Oh man. No, how much time you, I wanna bl- you know how you can block like mentions and like words and phrases on Twitter. <laughs> like if I could block Elon Musk and like all sentences around him it's like Voldemort. Like, from my perception, I would, I'm just so sick of hearing about him. Straight up. He who shall not be named. I call him space Karen, <laughs> space Karen. That works. Yep. Mm-hmm. Space yeah. Karen. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys having me today. I've had a great time. Oh, yeah. It's been great. Uh, Joe, is there anything going on in the community you wanted to mention? I have the sheet. Ah, the sheet. The sheet. Um, a few things. Uh, Wichita Falls Public Library has story time on Thursday mornings at 1030. Uh, our dental hygiene department is hosting Give Kids a Smile Day, Monday, February 20th. Uh, MSU's Texas Theater will present Ron Hutchinson's Moonlight and Magnolias, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, February 23rd through 26th. Uh, Unique beauty of Midwestern State University's DalQuest Desert Research Station in the Big Bend area of Texas is the subject of a photography exhibition at the Wichita Falls Museum of Art. Uh, Barefoot in the Park has performances on Stage 2 Dinner Theater through February 25th. Uh, we mentioned this one before, Arts Live Home and Garden Festival is returning the weekend of February 25th, 26th at Ray Clymer Exhibit Hall. Wichita Falls Symphony Orchestra presents Tchaikovsky Revisited at Memorial Auditorium on February 25th. And uh, Casting Crowns is doing their Healer Tour uh, at Kay Yeager on March 24th. Um, and for more information on those, you can check out the events calendar uh, at the MSU Texas homepage or uh, discover Wichita Falls slash events. That, that sounds like a really busy spring. So uh, yeah, I hope, I hope someone found something interesting there that they'd be, um, that they'd want to actually check out. Cause that sounds like a lot of really varied stuff. Yeah. There, well, and it's, it's a, that's the thing we've talked about before. If, if you're bored here, you want to be, cause there's stuff to do. There's a um, lot to do there. Yeah. That's awesome. 
But just remember, guys, uh, everybody that I've run into down here in the five, six years since I left Wichita Falls, one thing is they think you're in Kansas, which we knew kind of, but it's weird to me because these are people in Texas, but they are straight up, oh, you're from Kansas. I'm like, no. So there's that little issue. <laughs> but the ones who do know about Wichita Falls, I can't tell you guys to a man, they love it there. People from down here think it's a beautiful place and that you have a lot going on. And so I think what I would I would say to people in closing is I miss it there, you know, a lifelong live person who lived there. But yeah, there is so much to do for such a small and, and kind of, you know, community up there that uh, you don't see in a lot of other places. Um, and I don't know if that's by the nature of the geography. Um, Probably. We're a little, there. We're a little um, isolated, unfortunately. But yeah, it's yeah. it's funny to hear people go, oh, it's so nice there. They really <laughs> like it. I, I'm always reminded of that that line from uh, King of the Hill when when <laughs> when they go to watch the the Dallas training camp and Bobby goes, Wichita Falls is the greatest town on planet Earth. Yep. Like, <laughs> well, from us here at Moffat Library, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this one. Thank you all so much for listening, and we will catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.